Hello, hello, hello. You are listening to an episode of A Bite of I Am Derek, and I am joined by the dot to my bubble, the doctor to my who, the Susan to my twist, Noah. Hi. <laughs> oh, you're the TARDIS to my doctor. Whoa. Happy Pride Month. <laughs> Happy Pride Month, everybody. <laughs> woo, woo, it's June. <laughs> If you're watching us, you can see I'm in my um, rainbow tie dye your shirt. I love it. Yeah, you got Hello Kitty on. Yes, and I'm you know a homosexual, so <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the pride icon Hello Kitty. She was on an episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah, she was. <laughs> and then they all had to make their own little Hello Kitty friends, like actual. Okay. Oh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. It was season six. Well, <laughs> so today we are talking. No, season seven. <laughs> Sorry. Today, we, the, the RuPaul fanatics are going to go after you. Me. But yeah. <laughs> Today, we're talking about Doctor Who, episode five, Dot and Bubble, an episode long in the making from Russell D. Davies and Stephen Moffat. They had talked about it, Smith era. We finally got it. Interesting. Lots to talk about in this one. I'm kind of curious of how they change things from the Matt Smith era to the Shuti Gatwa era. Well. <laughs> but like, what did it originally look like? Right. I don't know. Mm. No idea. They're right. not saying. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll probably keep it that way. So before we get into everything, make sure you're following us on every platform imaginable. Just like Dot and Bubble. Put your bubbles up and your dots on and follow us. Make yeah. sure we're in your friend list. Yeah. <laughs> Do not block us. <laughs> That'd be great. And also, you know, it's Pride Month. So if you want to support queer indie creators, we have a Patreon. You can um, go there. You can watch our episode on the 2000s X-Men. We released that recently. That was fun. Yes. We talk about leather. We talk about Professor X and we talk about Wolverine. That's it. All the gay things. All the gay <laughs> things. Exactly. Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. <laughs> and the fashion, of course. Yeah. And then as always, if you have any thoughts on Doctor Who, X-Men, anything, or just your current favorite pop culture obsession, email us at abonibbles at gmail. We like a little ma- mailbag. I was going to say a mailbag. <laughs> oh, they're true. <laughs> Sorry. Happy Pride Month. <laughs> All right. So spoilers ahead yeah. for Doctor Who Dot and Bubble. Mm-hmm. So let us officially take a bite of Doctor Who Episode 5 Dot and Bubble, written by Russell T. Davies and directed by Dylan Holmes Williams. Lindy Pepper Bean leads a happy, lazy life in fine time where she connects with her influencer friends using her Dot and Bubble works two hours a day, and forgets how to walk. Her friend list is hacked by the Doctor and Ruby, who are warning her that slug-like beings are chowing down on her besties. However, for more reasons than one, Lindy is finding it hard to follow the Doctor's directions, which will very well lead to her own demise. Good. Bitch. (laughs) All right, so lots of thoughts on this one. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this episode, the 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 dot in the bubble of this episode, Give us your general thoughts. Okay, so this episode was like this. Come on, guys. This is about addiction to social media. Come on, come on. And I'm like, yeah, get them. They're right. And then at the end, they're like, it's not. And I was like, whoa. (laughs) Those are my thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I. This season as a whole has been very interesting. We only have, what, eight episodes, which is very short for Doctor Who season. So it's interesting to get two episodes where they're kind of doctor light Mm -hmm. in a way, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that shooting schedule and everything that it makes sense. But it is interesting that each one has almost been like a standalone episode in a way, instead of, you know, kind of an overarching thing that we usually get in the seasons. Mm. I like it. It's just like different as a longtime Doctor Who fan. So I'm liking these snippets. I'm curious to see how after rogue the next episode and then the two kind of parter finale how that's going to wrap the whole season together um but i really enjoyed this episode i think it looked great i think the acting performances were absolutely amazing and the commentary was good Mm. i think that they did a good job of trying to wrap a bunch of commentary in one thing and then the ending really cementing what this whole thing was about yeah this episode really feels like an outlier to me at at least compared to the ones that we've had before this i feel like in the four episodes prior to this you and i were sort of tracking things like babies and parents and music and snow and 
I feel like we really didn't get a, any of that in this episode. So it's it's interesting of being like, well, where does this actually fit in? Is it really part of the storyline or is it there for to make the commentary that it's making? I will be interested to see going forward if this is going to shape the doctor's views mm. or change him in a way mm. um, because you know we haven't gotten this yet with this doctor being a black man right and outright being you know racist to his face mm. um, and how that's going to inform his character going forward it's going to be interesting to see that so that's where i'm like is this going to inform it if not that's interesting yeah maybe it's going to be the thing where we we, we kind of said a couple of times in covering the series that He's a leap before he looks type of doctor, right? And he keeps getting himself into trouble because he just keeps going into it. So maybe now this is shaping him because he's going to stop and pause and think about who he's going to be helping and how he's going to be helping them. Ugh. All right. Before we jump to the end, because there's a lot to digest with mm. the ending. Like a like a slug. Like a slug. Um, love those slugs. Um, so what did you think about the technology of fine time, you know, where everything's fine all the time? Well, I think I mean, as far as the commentary on social media, although the ending commentary really wasn't about that, I think that there was commentary about social media. And, you know, I think that we all do get sucked into our phones. Granted, we don't have a bubble around us, but we are, you know, face to face with screens for most of our days. And so I think that that kind of fine time of us just being able to live in this perfectly curated pastel world is a reality that people want to live in. And so when you see Lindy Pepper Bean, who's sort of our main character here, this is where she exists and this is where she's most happy being, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? She's literally next to some of her friends, but she won't look them physically in the face. She'll only look at them on her screen, which is, I mean, how a lot of Gen Zers are, right? It's like they have this I mean, I guess the society as a whole now, right? It's this echo chamber, right? And the bubble is like a physical manifestation of this echo chamber that people are in and only curating what they want to see. They don't look outside of their bubble. I thought it was a really cool shot when she is in her office and they're trying to tell her, like, look around, look through your bubble. So she's still protected by her bubble and she's looking, but she still doesn't want to like mm -hmm. register it. And she just wants to go back into her bubble. And it's a very... I think, you know, this episode is very Black Mirror light. It's like a family friendly version of Black Mirror almost. And it's like, yeah, we, we've seen this commentary before. I think the way they did it was really interesting, having the physical bubble and there's a dot that does it and how that society works. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things we've seen before, mm. right? Yeah, I think that it is kind of funny to think about how even you and I who work in the same place, sometimes we'll just message each other instead of walking to each other's office. Well, it's like a walk <laughs> opposite sides of the building. But, you know, there is there are people who literally work in the office next to me and will still message each other on Discord it's instead fine. of walking into each other's offices. But it's literally like connected by a door. Yeah, I can't send a GIF in real life. So I mean, that is true. How how will you know how I'm expressing myself? Look at my face. I don't think so. Yeah. You need a gif and an emoji. <laughs> yeah, <for> sure. <laughs> I I love when we sort of have these what we think are utopic societies, and they're very much based in like these pastel colors, right? It's it's interesting because the buildings and everything they look like kind of regular brick buildings, maybe some sort of nondescript European city, mm. but the way that they're all dressed and they're all the same age. And, you know, they are kind of fitting this one type of human of what it is to be popular. Yeah, it's the the idyllic society of everybody looking the same and no individuality, because why not? <laughs> well, it's it's you know, I'm, I'm kind of, again, looking at the way social media has shaped us now. Uh, there are those funny memes, which I feel like I fit into since my birthday was just last week. Um, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Um <laughs> I'm a millennial, so I existed in a time where there wasn't social media right. and how when it's like me at 13 and we're like a total mess and it's like 13 year olds now and they're all exact, you know, they're on perfect. TikTok doing the exact same dance with the perfect makeup, perfect hair. And it is it's it's kind of we've we've become that right. And in order to be, quote unquote, popular, you have to follow this one trend. Yeah. You know, and, and so in this society, there are all these perfect pastel people. From a like visual standpoint, I think this set looked amazing. And it's like, would I live in that? Yeah, probably. Would I wear what they were wearing? No. Um, but aside from like the way it looked, 
this episode did a good job of okay actually i'm I'm curious of what um some viewers think about it um after watching it right did you recognize what it was trying to tell you at the beginning or was it until the end i think russell t davies had said something about like you know it's going to be interesting for like white viewers to like catch on to when it, it it's interesting because it's doctor who mm. and for like a lot of their episodes is primarily white. And that's the one thing I will always criticize about Doctor Who. It's like they could have more people of color in it. And especially with Martha, I'm going to get off the soapbox in a minute. But she, when is she going to be mentioned? She was a companion. She's a person of color. It's like, like, come on. Like, there, there's something where it's like, yes, I guess like you were, you were saying this thing and it has a commentary on racism, but also it's Doctor Who mm-hmm. created by primarily white people Mm -hmm. and most of their cast is white so it's i think it's almost disingenuous to be like did you catch on it's like well this looks like every episode right that's very true until you told us this is how this society works right so that's like my main criticism with this episode do i think it was done well yeah but i think it's weird to be like did you catch it Uh, well (laughs) well Maybe that's the question, right? Is why did it have to be a did you catch it thing, right? right? Why did it have to be once there was that final reveal in the last five to 10 minutes of this episode? Did we then have to go, oh, that's why Lindy did this? That's why Lindy, like, why wasn't it like, no, she's overtly racist and that's the storyline? Yeah, I I would be interested to see. So this was an episode that was kind of discussed between Moffat and uh, Russell T. Davies back in, I believe it's the Smith era. Matt Smith era. And I'm curious how this episode would have been then. I know they said they couldn't do it because the technology wasn't there or the budget wasn't there. Um, so now that they have a person of color being the doctor and having them kind of take the brunt of it is interesting. I'm, I would have been curious to see how that would have worked prior. They have done episodes where like societies are racist and overtly that way. Um, well, I think one of the interesting things is that they played off a lot of Lindy's actions throughout the episode as microaggressions when in reality they were just aggressions, aggressions, right? And so why did we code them as microaggressions when they were really just aggressions? I'm curious if it was, right. I'm curious if it was more of like, you think it's about social media, right? It's also about this. Mm -hmm. And that was like the underlying thing, which I think it did catch me by surprise at the end. I was like, oh shit, they're all racist. The society is racist. Um, so yay for the slugs. <laughs> As two white people talking about this, I want to know, like, what does Shuti Gatwa think of this episode? Well, you, so in the Doctor Who Unleashed episodes, this was his first shoot as the doctor for the season. Um, and I believe in the episode, they had had discussions of like, should this be his first shoot going into the doctor, especially, you know, talking about race and being the person that's being attacked by that. Um, but they went ahead with it. And I think, I mean, performance amazing these are the moments uh, not racism these are the moments of the doctor where they really shine and it gets to show them all the different layers of the doctor that look that he gives when he's going into the TARDIS looking back is heartbreaking and I don't want I personally feel it's not rage or hatred towards that person it's just this overwhelming like sadness of Mm. like and frustration Mm. of like I'm telling you i can help you and you're not doing it because of what because of what society told you that is the fine time standards is just it's heartbreaking but god he knocked it out of the park with that performance yeah you can really feel all these very mixed emotions of anger and disappointment and frustration and sadness in him looking at this group of people and being like i have an infinite amount of space in this you know, police box, just come with me. I will absolutely 100% save you. And them saying no. Right. And so I think there's a lot packed into the final moments of this, especially for Shuti. And so in playing the doctor in this episode, I'm wondering if the doctor is picking up on these cues throughout the episode, like how we were supposed to, or if he was just as surprised as we were. I think that's interesting because while the doctor being well-traveled and well in time, um, I don't think, you you know, there's been episodes, like I said, where there's like the core of it is racism or there's a racist society. Um, I don't think he did Mm. until it was there until Mm. they were there in person because the whole time, like, I mean, he even said, 
when Ricky September was on the thing, which yay for a, a gay moment of the doctor being like, ooh, he's cute. And then Ruby and the doctor kind of like bickering about that, which I thought was really funny. But the whole time, I don't think he picked up on that because it's really interesting to then know the ending and look back on it because he went up on her bubble first. She immediately blocked him. But then when Ruby came up there, she didn't block him. She listened to her. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the first instance. But I don't think from their point of view, they would have known that. Well, I even think for us, from our point of view as the viewer, we're thinking, oh, maybe it's just because he's a man. Right. She feels more safe with a more persistent. Right. With just like seeing another woman, you know, kind of popping into her friend. But it's not that at all. And, you know, I'm kind of thinking of the doctor as sort of a civil servant in a way. Right. (laughs) And so because I'm thinking like what situations have maybe I been in where something similar has happened, Um, granted, not through racism, but homophobia. Mm -hmm. And so as a civil servant, uh, as a librarian, we want to serve everyone that's coming into our libraries. But many times queer librarians are having to serve homophobic people. And so what do you do? Right. You know, and and when when you're there to serve them, maybe you're there serving them every day, helping them find out information or log onto your computers or attend a program. And then when you put up a pride display, they freak out. Right. Right. What, what do you do in that instance? And it's keep it up. Well, you, you, as hard as, <laughs> yeah. as hard as you can, you fight to keep it up. Right? right. But now knowing that you're serving a community that doesn't accept you. And so at least in this doctor's timeline, this is the first time he's dealing with something like that. Right. Because he is, he's sort of like this time space, planetary civil servant who just goes around looking to rescue people. But then what happens when those people don't want your help after all? Yeah. Especially if you've helped them all this time. Yeah. I know whenever uh, Jodie Whittaker became the doctor, there were some instances of her being the doctor being a woman. And there were some things of like, you don't know what you're talking about. Or she'd be in a certain time where like women were seen as dumb or not in the workspace. And she quickly overcame that. So Mm. I think it's good for us to have the doctor who can change to anything that they want to be to have these types of things, right? To be able to have these conversations. Um, Yeah, I I think it's interesting from an alien standpoint. It's like, how, when did he recognize that from a character perspective, right? Mm -hmm. I know the actors going into there knew what this was, but I think it's an interesting thought experiment to be like, oh, maybe that's why he didn't catch it immediately because you know, it's alien. Right. And I mean, who knows if like alien societies are racist, they could be, but what does that concept of that thing right. look like? And this, it might be the doctor in all of his lifetimes in all of their lifetimes, excuse me, meeting this fine time society. Right. Right. So, so they don't have their encyclopedia of I've been here before. I know what this is about. And I just want to say something, sorry to go back that I'm not equating being gay to being a person of color. I am right. just trying to look at a small instance where maybe I would feel some way this prejudice. way, but prejudice, but I could obviously, you know, code switching is a real thing. Um, and I can, you know, as whatever, I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's important, right. And yeah. I don't think that we would ever claim to be experts on this thing. So let's take a step away from sort of the themes of the episode <laughs> and get into this sort of universe of this season and the appearance of our favorite mystery person, Ugh. Susan Twist. Oh, my God. So this is the only instance of a mother child relationship, you know, and those themes that we've been looking for throughout the season where Lindy calls, well, gets watches a message from their home world. And her mother is Susan Twist. Yeah. And and, interesting. And on either side of it. Right. Doc, the doctor is going, wait, I know this person. And Ruby's going, I know this person, but they know her from different places. Right. Because the doctor wasn't there in 73 yards. Right. It's also I just want to point out, it's like, are you guys not talking? about this together right what are they doing in that tardis (laughs) they're just playing checkers and doing fashion shows (gasps) and there's also something interesting to think about of this not being the ruby that was with him when susan twist was the ambulance because he says that's the face of the ambulance and she says no i know her from somewhere else right so the ruby that was with him at the ambulance is the one that had to live that horrible life right and now this is the new ruby right but she still has some of that residual memory right stuff happening so it's like one of those things where it's like you know how sometimes you see somebody and you're like, you look familiar. Mm. Maybe you've never met them, but they just, for some reason, have that like familiarity. It's that deja vu of it all. Right, right. So it's going to be, you know, again, I don't believe Russell T. Davies saying that like they didn't have extras. Everybody in fine time on those bubbles, there was no AI or special effects. They were all actual 
different extras and yeah. people. Because AI could not play a character named Hoochie Pie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They could not play a character named Gothic Paul or Dr. P. <laughs> Dr. P. Dr. P. And his entire job is to monitor people's P levels. <laughs> Which means that they must have some sort of chip in them. Oh, they're connected every, in right? every which way. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole society as a whole are arrogant and stupid mm -hmm. and cannot do anything without their technology, which is sad, but also kind of true. Mama Google Glass. I do want to say, kind of stepping back from the Susan Twist thing, because we mentioned this. I have now, growing up in the age of maps and map quests and everything, and now with like Apple Maps and Google Maps and everything, I couldn't get around without it. And I hate that I'm so dependent on it. Right. It's like I can get around in my normal areas. But if I'm like, oh, I have to go to this one store in a town I've never been in. I don't know how to get there. No way. <laughs> Imagine if someone handed me a paper map. I was like, can you get us there? I'd be like, actually, no, no, <laughs> I cannot. Are these updated? <laughs> when was this yeah. redownloaded? Like, absolutely. I'm totally with you. And I think that we do have a lot of dependency on technology. And we see that here. I mean, the fact that when she does not have her bubble around her, she doesn't even remember how to walk. She's an idiot. I mean, there's that. Yeah. But Callie Cook, amazing. Like she. Well, you know, there's phenomenal. a there was a lot of pressure on her to really carry this episode. She was really the one that was there for, I would say, 95 percent of it. Yeah. And the fact that for a lot of it, it's from the view of her bubble. So it's like the camera is so tight on her face the entire time. I think she really carried it off. Yeah, she did a good job of showing all the different layers of like emotion to diabolical, mm. um, which I thought was great. And if it wasn't for her, this episode could have went sideways mm -hmm. real quickly. Like, I'm glad they found somebody that could carry it. Yeah, um, I don't really know her from anything else. I'm sure she's probably like a star on some BBC show. Mm. Um but phenomenal. I hope to see her again and something else. Yeah, she was she was a really interesting character. And I think she did a good job bringing her to life. One of the other characters I want to talk about is Ricky September. <laughs> and so he's sort of like the main influencer, right? He's the one that they all want to know and be friends with. His hobbies is you. You. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, yeah. And it's really interesting, right? When we look at what he does, he literally sings itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini and everybody loves him. And I couldn't help but think of that. Remember when Musical.ly was a big thing? Oh, yeah. It was like that sped up music thing. And remember when that one kid was doing it like in front of his grandparent that was like dying in a bed Vaguely. behind him? Yeah, he's like singing this like song and like doing like the weird movements. And like it's literally like his elderly grandparent is on like a ventilator or something. Yeah, I, I believe But like you. that's what it's gotten to, right? It's yeah. like kind of take any opportunity that you can to be trending and to go viral. And so the fact that Ricky September's day, he just wakes up and sings this song from the 60s and everybody's like fawning over him. It's scary. I love that they got the rights to that song, but none of the Beatles songs. And the devil's court. <laughs> I did. I just did a quick little Google search on itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. I don't think you need to say the title every time. <laughs> That's the title. But okay. It was number one in the US. It was like number one in Germany. It was number one in the UK. Now? Like, no. Well, when oh. it came out in the 60s. <laughs> I thought it because of the episode. I thought oh. it. This is this is Doctor Who's Kate Bush <sighs> of that hill. <laughs> At least that song's good. Right. Oh, man. But good needle drop. I think they 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 are now associating. I don't know anything about that song or what it's about or who wrote it. Um, but I now like that I'm going to think that it's like haunting because of like this episode. Spooky, spooky. <laughs> well, you know, I do think that there is maybe this is me looking into it too much, but there is a bit of a correlation between the song and this episode. Because the song is about a girl who's shy and she puts on the, I won't say the whole thing, bikini. Uh, and she doesn't want to like go out of the locker room. And then when she finally gets into the water, she's afraid to get out of the water. Right. And so you can kind of see that mirroring Lindy, who's afraid to come out of her bubble and explore the world around her. You know, that's that's me really trying to draw a line. Mm, I think there's a difference between like, I, I get it. But it's like, Lindy, you can't associate with that song. No, <laughs> you're racist. <laughs> I do want to talk about Ricky September, right? Because I think his character is interesting and I don't want to say that, oh, he's the best one, you know, because we don't know if he's racist or not, you know, and it, like he is probably just as racist. As he the reads rest of books, them. though. We know that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Like what kind of books? <laughs> 
because I, I've just seen a lot of people on social media be like, oh, he was gone too soon. It's like, well, I mean, we don't I don't let's not go. He's there. still a fine time in. Right. I you think know? he gave a great performance. His death. I want to say is probably one of the most graphic deaths in Doctor Who. Like it barely was out of the frame when that dot went through his head. I, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I was shocked. I think I looked at you and I said, that's new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were both shooketh. And I think that that is right when the episode turned. Right. Those last 10 minutes. Yeah. And especially for her, this is the moment speci- specifically for Lindy where she will do anything to survive. And she dead names him and was like, okay, bye. I'm not going to help you. Thanks I, for doing all this. Yeah. God. Yeah, that was really it was it was it was really brutal, especially because he spent so much of his time and energy saving her. And then she bold faced lies to Ruby and the doctor saying, oh, well, you know, he went back because he had more people to save. He wouldn't come. That look because it's showing her facing her friends and they're asking questions. And anytime she has to turn around to address them, she gets this like, "Ugh, these people like. Oh, let me put on a fake smile Mm -hmm. and talk to them. It's so gross, but so well acted in that part. Because it's true. You you see these two-faced people all the time. Like, you know, on social media is one thing, but in person you have to, you know, put on a face because you don't want to upset anybody. Ugh, gross. But so let's talk about the slugs real quick. Mm. Because um, I think they look great. I think they're like kind of cute in like a terrifying way, but also the stars and heroes of this episode. Well, yeah, that's my whole question is where did they come from? I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> I'm glad they destroyed the home world and they were like, you know what? We're going to go kill your babies too. Yeah. All those racist babies. Get them. Because, <laughs> I mean, we have to wonder if there is a history between the home, whatever this race of people is called, and these slugs. Did they take over their home world? Did they push them out? And, and now they're acting on revenge. It is interesting to think that the dots were in on it too. So whatever AI or whoever created this thing decided to kill them, right? And or you know to take out these people because it seemed very much like the slugs and the dots were in on it. Yeah, because they were going in alphabetical order, killing all of them. Mm-hmm. And for the dots to be like, oh, we missed one in that name. Okay, let's go after this thing. It's it's interesting. I don't think we're ever really going to know. But from Doctor Who Unleashed, they actually have a name, the slugs. Man trappers. Man, tra- they do. They catch them and they just devour them, which yeah. is very cool. It's very cool. There, I also think there's something to be said about AI, right? And so right now, AI is like in a sort of a gray area in a lot of ways. And in this particular episode, the AI of the dot and bubble learned that this race of people was horrible and racist. And so they had to kill them. Yeah. So th- at least there's that. Yeah. Bye. Long lives the slugs down with fascism and racism. <laughs> I just love that. I want somebody to make a poster because when they show the home world, there's that slug on the building and everything is like destroyed. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you go slug. That slug's like, look at what we've done. Yeah. Congratulations <laughs> to us. I, I love them so much. They're the heroes of this episode. A hundred percent. So um, the episode as a whole, it's interesting because it's like, I don't want to call it like a Dr. Light episode because he was actually in it for quite a bit. But I think the function of it, right, because this is his first shoot. He's still filming the last season of Sex Education. I think they did a good job of still incorporating him as much as possible into this episode with it being on the FaceTime, right? It made Mm. more sense for the episode. Um, It's short season. So I'm like, please, from here on out, like, let's stick with the companion and doctor because I need a little more. With both of them. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm feeling a little like, okay, I got to know, you know, Ruby a little more, but like, I know this doctor, but I want to see them together. Like, let me see them run around together. Yeah. And I think that in our next episode, we're, I think it would be a disservice to the character to not see him dealing with what happened in this episode. And so we need to see how Ruby fits into that in trying to maybe comfort hit him in some way. I, I liked this little detail in the scene where it finally hits them of like what's happening and you can see Ruby get upset mm. before it like sets in with the doctor. And I don't know if this detail was intentional, but it's like she was raised by a black mother and a grandmother. Absolutely. And so I'm sure they had those conversations with her and for her to realize that. And her first thing is to comfort him, but also she lets him have his anger and lets him say what he wants to say, which 
I think is very important. And mm-hmm. I liked that little detail of it because it's, it's about him. Like let him deal with it in whatever way he wants. Right. But she's there to comfort him. I just want to give this doctor a big hug <laughs> after this episode. Like there's been so many moments where there's shots of him just crying or just in distress. And I'm like, I want to like hug you, please. <laughs> and it's, you know, in looking at this doctor, he, he feels like the most exuberant, the most joyous, the most smiley, but yet he's been really put, been put through some things in uh-huh. these first few episodes that are really just sort of breaking down all of his natural instincts. Yeah. And so what happens to a doctor when the joy isn't there? Yeah. Um, let's, let's give our final thoughts on the end of the episode. Cause I feel like we keep circling back to that. Mm. Um, so let's just give our final thoughts on it. Right. So whenever they all are back there and, you know, Lindy's like, Ugh, or whatever, like, I thought I blocked you or, you know, he's not as dumb as he looks, all the microaggressions and things directly to his face. Uh, there is a line that that dude that just volunteered to be the leader of the thing. He said something about he wants to they want to fight, tame and own the wilds just like our ancestors. And I was like, Ugh. but what, what did you think about them not showing the demise? Of them, like they're just going to go off. I'm trying to lean into sort of this poetic ending or however you want to call it. But I would have even just have really liked to even see them sailing out on that boat and watching slugs come up, not actually (laughs) watching them be devoured, but watching the slugs follow them and knowing that they're going to get them. This sort of ambiguous her just looking at them and him looking at her that fell a little flat for me. Personally, I liked it on the doctor side, like her side. I'm just like, mm, don't look at him. You don't mm-hmm. deserve to look at him. I don't mind it. I'm, I'm trying to find the reason behind it. But I think it's one of those things where it's like, I guess we could assume, right? They can't do anything without technology. They can barely walk. So I don't think they're going to be able to survive right out in the wilds. But also it's that thing of like, you know, they're talking about their ancestors, what they did before them. And it's like, oh, you just you literally got help. By a minority. Right. And then you're just going to go out there and do the same thing. Ugh. Yeah. And I think it's kind of a, a choice that we see sort of the goodest one, right? Ricky September get a ball through the head. And then when the most evil of them, Lindy, we just see her sail off. I think we can assume the ending for them. I hope Show they, me the ending. <laughs> no, the I want to watch her screaming and the, getting eaten by a slug. The slugs are going to get them. I Absolutely. Hope so. yeah. They have to. I mean, <laughs> we, we now uh, we have to think we have an army of balls and an army of slugs that are surely going to come out of the dome and get them. Good. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. Get them. But I wanted to see it. So we're finally over. Not finally, but we're actually now over the halfway mark. For this season, mm-hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts of this season so far? Do you have any like hopes of where it's going to go in the last three episodes? Um, I think that it's I've enjoyed it really going through these five episodes. I've enjoyed all of the episodes. I now in these last three, I want to see us closing some of these circles. I want to see us answering some of these questions, maybe not all of them, but I really want to see why this doctor and why Ruby and this companion are together on this journey. Mm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. The the next episode is interesting. I'm curious to see what that's about. It's Rogue. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jonathan Groff is in it. We're finally getting like a proper, it seems like, alien society. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of this, we've been on Earth or like Earth-like places with not many aliens, you know, um, which is interesting for Doctor Who because a lot of times it's like you have the Cybermen, you have the Centaurans, you have all of these people. Where are the Daleks? I mean, I that is one thing I am liking. It's different way different Mm -hmm. that we haven't gotten any standard like doctor who villain so i'm curious when and if they will show up Mm -hmm. um but this next one seems fun very bridgerton looks really gay jonathan groff and the doctor there may be some singing yeah so two thumbs up yeah hopefully yeah i'm very excited for that one so um that's coming out after it it premieres (laughs) (laughs) I was like, what day is it? <laughs> no. Friday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So let us know what you thought of Dot and Bubble. Very curious to know your thoughts. Yeah. Interesting episode. Yeah. It was like pastel terribleness. 
Pastel racism. Yeah. Ooh. Welcome S- to America. Space racism. <laughs> Spacism. We just need the doctor instead of space babies. Space racism. <laughs> oh, where's, where's Captain Poppy when we need her? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Till next time. Bye. Bye.